going to take a look at a quick review of Newton's laws as well as how to approach problem solving through the different equations that we have. The first one that I'm going to start with as an example problem in, uh, is going to use Newton's first law of motion. Newton's first law describes objects that have inertia or that resist change. So these objects are not going to accelerate. That means if they are resting, they stay at rest. If they are moving, they stay moving, and they keep the same speed. So I'm not going to get faster, and I'm not going to get slower. I'm not going to turn. They're going to keep the same speed, and they're going to continue to move in a straight line. Inertia occurs when the forces that are acting on an object are in equilibrium, when they're balanced, meaning that if I have a force pulling up, it would need to have something pulling down at exactly the same amount. If I have something going to the left, I would need something pulling to the right, again, at exactly the same amount. So if I'm in my car and I, have, uh, and I apply a force of 5 newtons to the gas pedal, in order for me to not accelerate, the road has to pull back on my car with that same force. If the road has more friction than I do, I'd slow down. If the road has less friction than I'm putting on the gas pedal, then I would speed up. So to keep that same velocity, that same motion, I would need them to be balanced. Same thing goes for up and down forces. If gravity is pulling on me, with 10 newtons in that downward direction, and I'm st uh, sitting on a table or sitting in a chair, then that chair has to push up on me with that same 10 newtons so that I keep balance, so that my um, behind stays rested on that table or in that chair. As a real quick extra note, inertia is based on mass. The more mass that something has, the more inertia it has. So larger objects are going to be harder to accelerate, harder to make speed up, harder to make slow down. If you had to make an elephant move when it was sitting down, that would be difficult. If I had to make an elephant stop charging at me when it was running full speed, that would be equally as difficult. So inertia is based on the mass. The more mass something it has, the more inertia it has, the more force I would need in order to balance it out and keep that constant velocity. So to apply some of these to the equations that we have, okay. if something has a constant velocity, I've made a problem here. Okay. We have a 49 newton object being pushed with 12 newtons of force and maintains a constant velocity. When we push something, we call that an applied force. So I draw a free body diagram. The free body diagram is a simple picture. This box could represent a box, it could represent a car, it could represent an elephant. So this is my object that I am applying the forces on. And then I'm going to label any forces that might be acting on that object. So right off the bat, I know I'm applying a force of 12 newtons. I'm going to put that over here on the right hand side um, next to that force applied. Yeah, so a little A reminds me of the applied force. Okay. This first uh, part, when it's a number touching the word that it's describing, it's usually going to be describing the weight of the object. So it would be similar to saying that a 50-pound ball or a 50-pound uh, child. Um, so that's going to refer to the weight. Weight is the force of gravity acting on an object. So weight and gravity mean the same thing. Sometimes we will see it written as Fg, as we see in this one. It could also be written as Fw. Both are correct. It's just a matter it depends on uh, who's drawing it, which textbook we get it on, which website we look on. Okay. My weight comes from gravity. On Earth, we have a set value that gravity pulls everything down at. So the acceleration of gravity on Earth is always going to be the same number. It's going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. The negative represents that it's accelerating you downward. So every time that I am talking about gravity, this will be the acceleration that I have if there's no other forces being present, if I'm not being thrown downward. We learned that force is related to both the acceleration and the mass. 
So the force is the mass times the acceleration. The larger the mass, the less the acceleration. But the larger the force, the more the acceleration. So looking at how those balance off of each other. In this case, they've told me my weight. They've told me my force. So they've given me that weight, that force of gravity. And I know how much gravity pulls every object downward at. From there, I'm going to be able to calculate the mass of this object. So 49 newtons for my weight is going to equal something and that negative 9.8. Now I want to remember that weight is pulling down. So because it's pulling downward, when I'm doing my math, I want to apply that negative. In order to solve this problem, I'm going to divide by negative 9.8 on each side. So over here it cancels. Negative 49 divided by negative 9.8. This tells me that my mass is going to be 5 kilograms. other rules that I know. I said that my box is in equilibrium. So because it's in equilibrium, it has that constant velocity, I need my forces to be balanced. Meaning that if I have 12 newtons going forward, I need 12 newtons pulling me backward in order to balance out here. If I have 49 newtons of weight, then I need to have 49 newtons being pushed up by my table, again, in order to balance those out. So these two will cancel each other out, and these two will cancel each other out. By rule, when my forces are balanced, we said that we have no acceleration. We said that we have no net force. So the rule was an object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion unless there's a net force acting on it. So I keep a constant velocity because there is no net force. All of my forces have balanced out and canceled. This means that I don't accelerate, and again, I don't have a net force. Now we recognize that things do accelerate on occasion, okay? and that's going to happen because of the net force. So objects accelerate when there's a net force. Remember, accelerating means speeding up, it means slowing down, or it means changing direction. You can find net force a few ways. I can find net force by combining the forces that are acting on an object. I want to apply this as if I was doing them like grid points. If that force is going to the right or up, I want to think of it as a positive force. If that force is going down or back, I want to think of it as a negative force. So my net force is going to be whatever is moving in the positive direction minus whatever is moving in the negative direction so that they can balance out and cancel. The other way that I can find the net force is by going based off of the relationship that we have looked at for our second law. We said that... Um, Acceleration is directly related to the force. So when the force gets larger, my acceleration gets larger. And we said that acceleration is inversely related to the mass. So if my acceleration gets larger, it could mean that my mass has gotten smaller. So those are the two ways that we've looked at that relationship. This equation represents Newton's second law. Another way that we can write that equation was if I multiply by m on both sides. So f equals m times a, which is a little bit more of the more common way of writing it. And this equation does describe the net force, the combination of all the forces that are there. So I've written a problem over here where we have a 3,000 gram object slowing down at a rate of 5 meters per second squared, and it encounters 24 newtons of friction. So from this sentence, I can pick out some information. I'm slowing down. So that's going to represent a negative. I've got that meters per second squared. That's my acceleration. So my acceleration is going to be a negative 5 meters per second squared. It tells me that I have friction of 24 newtons. So friction is working to the left. 
It's trying to slow me down. So I'm going to make that a negative, and again, it's 24. And here I have 3,000 grams. That's a mass. Now, in physics, we use kilograms as our base units instead of grams. So it's a quick reminder of how we convert. If I want to go from grams to kilograms, there are 1,000 grams in 1 kilogram. So I'm going to divide by 1,000 to get my kilograms. 3,000 grams would give me a total of 3 kilograms. So let's start to apply some of those rules that we've discussed. My weight is the force of gravity on an object. So my weight is going to come from the equation force equals mass times the acceleration of gravity times that negative 9.8. So for this problem, my mass is 3 kilograms. I'm going to use that negative 9.8, and that's going to tell me that my force is a negative 29.4 pulling down. So gravity is pulling me down at 29.4 newtons. My normal force is a force of something that supports me, that keeps me from falling, that keeps me from flying. So being as it is a supporting force, it needs to be a balanced force. Not falling through a table, I am not flying off the table. If I started on the table, I need to stay on the table. So this needs to be balanced with that weight force, with that gravity. So my weight pulling down is going to be the same as my normal force pushing up. So if this is going down at 29.4, this is going up at 29.4. The next thing that I can solve for is um, my net force. Because I have the mass, because I have the acceleration, I can find my net force. So my net force is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. Here, we are looking at the change, the total, the result. So I'm not using gravity, I'm using the resulting motion, the slowing down motion. So I've got 3 for my mass, I have negative 5 meters per second squared for my acceleration, and I'm going to multiply. This is going to give me a net force of negative 15 newtons. The last thing that I'm going to solve for is my, acceler is my applied force. Remember that net force, we had two ways to solve for. One was using the relationship between mass and acceleration like we just did. The other is by looking at a combination of the forces that are acting on the object. So my net force is also that combination. I already talked about the fact that my gravity and my normal force are going to cancel out. So my normal force and my gravity, those balance. That gives me zero net force in the vertical direction. But I do have a total net force. I want to go back at 15 newtons, which means that something is pulling me forward and something is resisting that motion, trying to slow me down. I know that my net force is negative 15 already from the previous problem. We were told that friction had a value of 24 Newtons. So I should be able to solve for the applied force, figure out how strong it is pulling in order to try to balance out that friction. The opposite of subtracting 24 would be to add it to both sides. So negative 15 and a positive 24, this tells me that my applied force is going to be a positive 9, or 9 newtons in that positive direction, that rightward direction. So whatever is pulling this way is about trying to balance this one, and I result with that negative 15. So from here, we've looked at our different equations. Okay. As a whole, we have about four different ways that we can solve problems. We can use the weight formula, where we're looking at anything that deals with weight, gravity, falling, things like that. So this would be my first formula that we have. 
The second thing that we've used is finding our net force based on mass and acceleration. We've also looked at the net force based on other forces. So if I have a normal force and a gravitational force, or air resistance and a gravitational force, an applied force and a frictional force. And these are more so in that horizontal direction. And then we've also looked at how we can um, convert from one form to another. So going from grams to kilograms, we're going to divide by 1,000. And then the last big fact that we started with was when we have that constant velocity. That means our forces are balanced. It means we're not accelerating. We have no net force. We have what we call inertia. Our equations are for weight, we're using mass times that negative 9.8 when we're on Earth, and that is the acceleration of gravity. For our net force, we can use the mass times our acceleration. We can also look at combining those other forces. So if I have a force going to the right, I'm going to subtract it from a force going to the left. If I have a force that is going I'm going to subtract it from a force that is going down. If my forces are in the same direction, then I'd add. If I have a force that's going in one direction on the x-axis and in one direction on the y-axis, then I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared, to find my resulting c squared. When a is 0, that means that there is no net force, means there is no change in speed or direction. Call that being at equilibrium, or having inertia. My last big rule would be just recognizing that when something has a normal force, it's going to typically be equal to that weight force going down. Because the normal force means that we have that support system. So I'm the last few big things that would probably help me in terms of solving problems is making sure that I know my units. Recognizing quickly that force is measured in newtons. That mass is measured in kilograms. That acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. Velocity is measured in meters per second. Uh, time is measured in seconds. There are occasions where we will have to go back to our old equations and potentially do two steps. So the other thing I might want to recall from previous units is that I can find acceleration by doing my final velocity minus my initial velocity divided by time.